I, I always, I think from a very young age, had that uh, sort of entrepreneurial spark. I, as I said, I grew up in a family where uh, people thought entrepreneurially, uh, we saw small business. You know, I would see my father, you know, work uh, when he, if he had to work 18 hours a day. I think there is something to be said for having your family already in business. There definitely, I believe, is an advantage to getting that entrepreneurial spark inside of you to see the example of your parents already doing business. Anyway, listen to Ira and see how he's moved himself and his family into a very, very risky business of developing new things for the drug industry, the healthcare industry. Very, very risky, but he's still done it. Really inspirational. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Ira. How are you today? Wonderful, Michael. Thanks uh, so much for having me today. This is very exciting. Well, I'm really excited always to talk to our our brothers and sisters across the pond. <laughs> we, we used to have this special relationship. <laughs> uh, we still have, I think. <laughs> it's, Absolutely. Providing Absolutely. Donald and Teresa don't mess it up. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining. I know... I am not an expert of your industry, and it's the kind of whole biotech um, area or or that industry that I don't know anything about. So I'm really looking forward to learning and hearing your story. But before we do, I have the same question I start with, and that is, would you mind sharing a little bit about your personal life? So where you were born, a bit about your education, where you moved, where you now live, uh, maybe a bit about your family, but you don't have to, any hobbies and interests that you might like to share, just so people get a sense of Ira and uh, who he is. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yes, I mean, so right now I am speaking to you from uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, here in the East Coast of the United States. Uh, and I actually live uh, about two blocks, two city blocks away from where I was born. So I, I didn't stray too far wow. uh, from the nest. Uh, I was born in 1968 here in Philadelphia. Uh, and I was born into a family of uh, people that were involved involved in the uh, community pharmacy business here in the Philadelphia area. Mm. So, um, you know, although I spent a lot of time in my early age in my father's stores, uh, cleaning the counters and vacuuming the floor, I was always around uh, medicine, uh, health care. Mm. Uh, business, a small business. Uh, and so it was sort of preordained that I they went down this path. Yes. Uh, I was educated as a pharmacist um, at Rutgers University in nearby in New Jersey and also uh, got a master's degree in business here in Philadelphia at Temple University uh, and spent the, uh, the last 30 years in one facet or another in uh, uh, what is thought of as the uh, conventional pharmaceutical industry whether that is uh, big pharma, uh, you know, work for British groups like GlaxoSmithKline, uh, also very small organizations, community pharmacies, and so forth. Uh, I, as I said, I still live here in Philadelphia. I have uh, a lovely wife and three young children who love living in the city. It's a wonderful place, very historical, a lot of uh, cross the pond history here as well, oh, <laughs> right I bet. outside. Um, and um, you know, we I love spending time when I'm not doing what I'm doing here and trying to solve the uh, the big problems of human uh, health and degeneration and uh, I spend time with my family and uh, we love to travel uh, we love to uh, just spend time uh, seeing movies and going to shows and amusements uh, I'm sort of a local guy uh, didn't stray too far from um, where I started out and this is where you find me today so I bet do you still have like your school friends that you know and they're still living in the city or moved away or are you still in touch with them 
You know, um, I still have some uh, that are local. Uh, yeah. Philadelphia is one of those cities that, you know, it's it's uh, from a geographic perspective, you're smack in the middle of the financial capital of the U.S. in New York and the political capital in Washington, D.C. Mm. So many people nonetheless uh, fly away uh, from this place, but uh, some stay around and just comically and coincidentally, my children all go to the same school that, that I get, that I went to wow. uh, in secondary education. So I see some of the same teachers nowadays. Oh. And, and I always get that look, you know, what are you doing here? You know, why are you still around 50 years later? But uh, anyway, uh, needless to say, uh, I see history in the past a lot, uh, sort of, and the spirits of the past sort of waft through my life nowadays <laughs> from that perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty unusual too, because, I mean, I, I, I've i traveled quite a bit in the US and I've worked for US companies. And what tends to happen with folks in the US, from my knowledge, is that companies are spread wide and far across the States. And therefore, you have to move a huge amount with your job. So that is pretty amazing that you're just a couple of blocks away from where you used to live, definitely. <laughs> well, the, the, the other interesting thing, uh, right across the street from where their school is, is, or used to be at least, the virtual world headquarters of GlaxoSmithKline. Mm. Although we think of GSK as a British company, and it does have its British headquarters, it's true headquarters in terms of the U.S. market was right across, literally uh, 10 feet across the street from the school. And so, you know, I went through a mergers and acquisition time uh, in my earlier career in the 1990s where I was acquired into GlaxoSmithKline. Mm. So uh, as fate may have it, uh, even though I worked for a, uh, you know, international business, uh, it, it happened. It was just situated right across the street oh and down my the block. God. So uh, the the forces that be sort of kept me local. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think the there is some. I'm, I'm jealous in a way because I'm 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 in the UK originally from Amsterdam, and whenever I go back to Amsterdam, I go, "Why wow, this is a great city! I wish I could live here again." And so yeah, there is something about still staying local. I think. Moving around is great, but being local to where you were born and grown up, that's that's pretty special. So well done. Thank you. Thanks. So, okay, so, so with your education and did you go to university, college? What did you do? Did you kind of study kind of in the farm? Oh, you became a pharmacist, you said. Was that right? Yeah, I started off uh, as a pharmacist, sort of a general education uh, undergraduate, uh, and then I went to business school. But I, I like to point out that my real education came in the industry, mm. uh, in the sense I came in more from the business perspective, more of a business development role. And when you're in business development in this industry, you interface with uh, everybody. So I have colleagues that are toxicologists and I learn all about, you know, the things that poison us and kill us. Uh, I have colleagues that are in clinical medicine that treat patients. Uh, I have colleagues that are in uh, uh, pharmacokinetics, the study of uh, how drugs enter your system and where they go. I even had a friend from actually down in New Zealand who was a pharmacoepidemiologist that <laughs> uh, sort of describes where, uh, you know, once a population takes a, uh, a drug, you know, sort of what the impact is over a long period of time. So I, I fortunately had this more generalist education on the job, uh, which allowed me to uh, spread my wings and see much more of the totality of what was going on uh, than just if, you know, if I spent an entire career, you know, just studying uh, cardiology or cardiac toxicology or something of that nature. Uh, mm. Nothing wrong with specializing, but it just, I'm, I like knowing the big pictures. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you got a, a broad sense of everything that was going on in all, all the different kind of st streams or developing different solutions to health. 
Absolutely. And so, you know, I point out, I, I started out very early on in retail. So I learned all about the, uh, that end of the business in terms of everything that happens with approved products and their path towards patients, whether that is in the retail setting or the hospital setting. Uh, and then I moved into distribution. I learned about OTC products. Uh, and then via acquisition, <laughs> I moved into big pharma. Yeah. Uh, and there I learned what was involved in not just taking a, you know, a billion dollar investment and turning a new drug into a registered product, but in getting it out to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of prescribers around the world um, and learn that whole side of the business. Um, and then, you know, while that's an exciting thing to do and people love that job, uh, after a while, um, I you know, realized that I didn't want to spend the majority of my life uh, trying to sell the next cholesterol lowering agent or painkiller mm. uh, and get back to doing something even more combining entrepreneurship with um, cutting edge technology and you know what's the future all about because I always had this passion for you know not just sort of seeing the future but sort of creating it yes uh, hence I said goodbye to big pharma and jumped into uh, biotech where for the last 10 years I learned or, or the previous 10 years I learned drug development mm. and what is involved in taking a an unknown substance or molecule or uh, and taking it through the development process and well, everything involved there so I got the full picture <laughs> of everything mm. uh, which really fed and fertilized my new interests in really changing the future and, and doing things in a different way than the last hundred years of the traditional industry okay so and what I mean what gave you the courage to kind of jump out and do something on your own? I mean, if you were on the kind of business development side to then create something um, from scratch, or did you already have an inclination of the direction you wanted to go into? How long did it take for you, you know, to, to realize, uh, to become aware in yourself that this is what you wanted to do? I, I always, I think from a very young age, had that uh, sort of entrepreneurial spark. I, as I said, I grew up in a family where uh, people thought entrepreneurially, uh, we saw small business. Mm. You know, I would see my father, you know, work uh, when he, if he had to work 18 hours a day to, to move the business forward, he did it. Um, and he never, you know, never skimped on time with me. But, um, you know, had this passion uh, not only to, um, pursue uh, an interest, but at the same time realized that, you know, nothing was uh, beneath him if he had to make the coffee and vacuum the floors at the same time that he was building the business. This was not an insult. Mm. Uh, you know, many people nowadays, uh, they, they rise to a certain level and they think things are beneath them. But when you get into this business, no, I, yeah. I still do everything today uh, from being the CEO. I still make the coffee uh, <laughs> and I do the small activities well, as well. And the, the other part of it, uh, well, there's two other parts. Uh, one is that sort of I have a tough you know, outer shell in the sense that uh, biotech is one of those areas that um, I like to say to people that are interested in it uh, is is prone for failure. Uh, it is very it's not like creating a new app for your cell phone yeah. uh, where you will have uh, the product in six months and profits shortly thereafter. This is a long term commitment. Uh, you will most likely fail many times uh, in a career. Uh, but if you can put up with failure, if you can put up with rejection, um, I say, you know, were you able to put up with, you know, girls, <laughs> you know, rejecting you for a date when you were younger? Yes. If not, maybe this isn't the space for you. But um, so, you know, I had that resilience. And lastly, sort of the third part of it, I jokingly say, you know, I love. I love science fiction. I love comics and superheroes. Mm. And um, I still have that childish zeal for, as I said, creating what is not here and creating the future uh, that we want to see, as opposed to just being a, you know, a participant and a passenger. Wow. And so tell us a little bit about like the journey of 
you know, setting that up, you know, what was involved in getting set up and how do you develop the ideas and, you know, so you, you're saying this is for drug development. Um, so it's mainly, um, it's, it's not technical, it's not devices, correct? So it's, it's mainly stuff that people are going to take. And so, so, so there's a double question. So the first one is, <laughs> how, how do you even start off creating something like that? Uh, well, you start off, and this is, I guess many people don't really know this, but uh, they think more of the early discoveries or uh, major initial findings are made by these large institutions. Mm whether they're big companies or, you know, uh, large uh, public sort of research initiatives. No, a lot of what happens uh, and where the real exciting things take place are at a university right. uh, where somebody is working on an idea uh, at the, you know, in, in biotech, we call it the bench. Uh, so making an interesting uh, discovery, which, you know, sort of is, you know, analogous to the embryo of, a life that will become something, uh, and but that embryo needs to be fed and watered and, and has to get all the nutrients to grow. So there, if you look around, not just in the United States, but all around the world, and you go to any university, you will find technology transfer offices. And at the technology transfer offices, you will find the thousands of discoveries that are being made every day by students uh, that are part of the university system. Right. And so with this particular case, uh, we took a technology, uh, an early stage technology that had to do with uh, so-called cellular reprogramming. So the ability to take a cell uh, in your body that uh, may be uh, part of a, a nerve or part of a heart uh, or part of your skin and erase uh, what it was and start over. Uh, to take a cancer cell that is damaged genetically and epigenetically and erase it, uh, clean it up and start over. Mm. And this was the very basis. So we had uh, some initial discoveries down at University of South Florida in Tampa uh, about 10 years ago, which we said, you know, there's something here that uh, maybe 20 years from now will be quite substantial. And that is, in essence, how we uh, got the idea from that point on. It was a matter of... Uh, you know, I'll say uh, drug development company 101, uh, raising initial capital, uh, setting up initial uh, laboratories. And, you know, we are not uh, nowadays, you know, a lot in this industry is done virtually because mm. there's just so much capacity out there. Big Pharma has jettisoned uh, a lot of manufacturing and an and R&D sort of incubator space and things of that nature. So a lot of things in our business at our stage, you don't need to build on your own. Yes. They exist. So a lot of it is plug into an ecosystem of possibilities. In some cases, it's just university labs where you can invest a little money and continue the work right there at the bench as it's yeah. been going on. So that is sort of the inception of, of how we got started on this particular path of this company. Okay. So this thing that happened in Tampa was the starting point. Is that right? Right. Uh, and it, it was at that point, um, and and some of it, I mean, uh, a lot of this goes back to uh, a gentleman over there in the UK that got the Nobel Prize uh, just a couple of years ago, Dr. John Gurdon, uh, who back in the 1950s uh, started exploring this concept of how eggs uh, or ooplasm, the, the biomolecular material inside eggs, uh, during the process of starting a new life, creating an embryo, uh, cleans up uh, the DNA and resets age uh, and does all sorts of other fascinating functions to get that new embryo fetus ready for life mm. in nine months. Mm. Uh, so Dr. Gurdon, he, you know, he spent decades doing this, uh, got the Nobel in 2012. Uh, we decided, you know what, uh, while a lot of work had been done in uh, analyzing that sort of technology in the Petri dish in the lab, we wanted to take it to the next step and say, look, 
we know of thousands of these biomolecular substances that are responsible for this. Let's begin to isolate them in our own lab. Let's purify them. Let's study what they are doing. What is responsible for resetting age? What is responsible for cleaning up DNA? Uh, what are the signals responsible such that all of our children are born with two arms, two legs, uh, ten fingers and toes, and so forth, and create pharmaceutical products at the end of the day that can mimic these capabilities in humans for purposes of regeneration, for purposes of tissue repair, and ultimately uh, for purposes of rejuvenation and sort of resetting age to a younger, more youthful point. Mm. Wow. It, it, that literally, yes, I can see why you're now talking, drawing similarities with comic books. <laughs> <laughs> he can see some professor in the lab in the comic book trying to create something there. That That's pretty big stuff. And um, that's also really, really brave to get into that field and to, you know, to do all of that. And I mean, I have no idea how long these things take before they start to materialize. I mean, how long have you been on this journey? of developing something? Well, we've, it took a few years to sort of get out of the entirely virtual mode. So in essence, there was a technology sort of from 2008 to 2011 that was in essence sitting there in the university system. And then we broke free of that and set up our own laboratories in 2011. So we've been at it for the last seven years or so. Yes. Uh, we are, you know, drug development and biologics development in this context is, uh, as everybody knows, this is a long-term uh, process. Traditional mm -hmm. drug development, you know, the, the timelines are 15 to 20 years nowadays with research budgets that go anywhere from a billion to $5 billion. So uh, it is a long process. We are taking some some uh, steps to move forward more rapidly. In the case of here in the U.S., we are focusing on uh, so-called orphan indications. These are uh, diseases that may have a smaller population, but which the FDA may allow us to fast track uh, through the clinic. Yes. And then also, you know, we are a U.S.-based company, but uh, in 2018, uh, we cannot ignore the fact that uh, there are you know, 200 other countries out there with really growing, evolving uh, medical and bio research capability. And so we cannot, although the U.S. is an important market and a very big one, we cannot ignore what's happening elsewhere. Uh, for instance, in Japan, they recently developed a uh, what is known as conditional approval path, where patients are now able to access your development stage drugs a little earlier uh, if they are no option or dying of sort of incurable diseases. Mm. So we need to keep in mind that, uh, you know, there's one path in the U.S., but there there are many other paths around the world, and we need to, in 2018, think globally, um, unlike how we've done things in the past. Sure, I understand. So, so what's been, in terms of starting this journey on your own or with some colleagues, what's been, like, you know, the biggest challenge that you've had to face with doing this? Um. Now, clearly, when you are trying to disrupt, um, and, and I, I point to the fact, okay, the pharmaceutical industry is a trillion dollar industry worldwide nowadays. Yes. Uh, annually, they spend two hundred billion dollars on new R and D. Uh, however, healthcare is a seven trillion dollar industry. Uh, it's a crazy number. It eclipses, you know, oil and natural gas and precious metal mining and and all these other industries. And it's in perpetuity, right? So, uh, health and disease and such. It goes on for infinity, technically, mm -hmm. as long as we're around. Unlike oil or, or whatever, which will run out at some point in the future. Uh, Health and disease goes on forever. Um, so it's a big, big industry. Um, and needless to say, when you are trying to disrupt sort of $7 trillion of industrial flow, let's say, yes. uh, you will run into um, people that like the status quo. Uh, pharmaceutical industry likes the status quo. They like creating treatments uh, that treat you for 
pill, you know, give you pills that you take for the rest of your life, mm. um, as opposed to curing things. Um, maybe certain investors uh, are invested in other companies that have competing interests. Uh, maybe Wall Street likes certain things happening uh, in the development of segments of the industry. So, you know, you're constantly in an industry where you require large amounts of capital to move through the process, always going to run into some roadblocks in, uh, in the area of finance. Yes. And that's okay because you know, I've been there before. I've, I've been on various sort of financial fronts in this industry. So I, I know my way around. Mm. Um, and it, that's less of a concern in the long run. Um, clearly, uh, you know, we run into sort of other ancillary or tangential uh, roadblocks. You know, there may be, you know, religious objections to some of the things we do uh, uh, or sort of societal implications when we talk about things like aging and, mm. and what happens in a population. But at the end of the day, we're fairly comfortable that, you know, curing disease uh, and increasing wellness and decreasing suffering um, is a good thing <laughs> uh, versus not doing this. So we're happy. Yes. And, and I mean, it's what everybody is after, right? Is to be that eternal good health, almost realizing that there is no such thing as eternal, but at least being able to live to a an age without any dis-ease, any pain, or, yeah, I mean, aging is a big thing, of course. Uh, if you can slow down aging, then, yeah, everybody would want a little bit of that, for sure. And so, was, was I mean, you mentioned a few things there, but what's the biggest thing kind of raising, because you had to raise money for this, correct? Yeah, we've we've raised money. Uh, we've raised a few million dollars so far from um, private accredited investors here in the United States. Uh, we'll have to raise more before the, you know, everything is said and done. Mm. But that's a, you know, that's one of the the parts of the industry. It's yes. just, as I said, unlike an app which you can put together in, you know, <laughs> yeah. your living room and uh, in your spare time. Uh, this is not something. Um, you know, although there is, you know, sort of this weird trend in so-called biohacking nowadays. Uh, no, I mean, the majority of all this stuff, it requires intensive capital and, uh, long-term effort. So, yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> this podcast is aimed, um, Ira, at people that are in jobs, might've been in jobs for a long time and are unhappy, they may be unhappy with the management, they may be unhappy with their progression, or they've always been dreaming about starting their own business. You know, their family like you might have been entrepreneurial in the way they had their own businesses, so eventually wants to get out and, and start on their own. But, <laughs> I mean, this business that you're involved in, um, would you say it was high risk for somebody to start off and do something like this? This, this is probably the most high risk thing anyone could do. Well, um, obviously, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe going to Mars yes. or, uh, or uh, creating uh, fusion technology are equally high risk things. Um, but those, uh, you know, large government organizations for the most part are involved in all of those continuum. Mm. In biotech, not as much. Uh, large government organizations fund early stage type of exploratory research. But at the end of the day, the translational part of the puzzle, the thing that takes that chemical uh, off the bench, as we say, and eventually puts it in hospitals and clinics all over the world, um, is an industrial activity. Uh, so yes, it, it's, it's very high risk. Um, and you know, the, the, the sort of the failure rates, uh, in this industry are huge. Mm. Uh, the number is, you know, the, the traditional number is one in 10,000 make it, uh, in certain areas like cancer research. I think the number is like one in 40,000. So, you know, once again, I, I point out, you will, you will most likely fail in doing this, mm. but the success possibilities uh, and the um, the excitement, you know, even if you fail, look, even if you fail, even if we fail, I look at it as, you know, we're still discovering things 
that are going to trickle down to other aspects of health. Yes. So even if you fail in traumatic brain injury research in the clinic, you're still going to uncover so many important things for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and spinal cord injury that it's worth it. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. Well, you uh, I mean, that, that almost seems there is a... I mean, obviously, because you've been in this industry from being very young and having lived and, and literally lived it, seen it, gone through it, it's just become part of who you are. There, there almost seems to be an altruistic, a um, philanthropic way that you're talking about it in which you're saying you know, you're really passionate about helping people become well and finding ways where this can be improved. Um, yeah. Um, I Look, um, just uh, you know, a, little, a little bit more about my family. Uh, I watched my father die of spinal cancer. Mm. Uh, I watched my mother die of uh, chronic lung disease. Mm. Uh, I watched my maternal grandfather die of heart disease. Um, and I sit here and, no, I cannot accept the fact that if you have a trillion dollars a year coming in uh, in 2018 and you're spending $200 billion annually in R&D, that you cannot come up with cures for some of the most dreaded ailments that are responsible for our demise and death. Mm. It, makes no, it makes no sense. Uh, and all you need to do is look back um, 100 years when we discovered the antibiotic. <laughs> we forget how long ago that was. Yes. And we really haven't done anything. We've made a lot of treatments and we've improved – uh, outcomes and sort of quality of life in certain areas. But as far as cure uh, versus treatment, we have no successes. No. <laughs> so, yes, there is uh, a philanthropic and altruistic component of this. Uh, and But a lot of it just feeds back into, you know, wanting to do things a little better than yeah. being 0% successful in, in these big problems. Wow, wow. I... I really do hope you're successful with this project, definitely, however long it may take to conclude to something. Um, so the, the, I asked about the challenges a little bit earlier. What have been for you some of the highlights in getting this set up? Uh, the highlights uh, come in the, uh, the beneficial... Uh, research results that we see yeah. uh, in terms of uh, some of the work we're doing in traumatic brain injury, uh, in spinal cord injury, in the reversion of uh, tumors uh, and turning them into normal tissue. And the and, and just so briefly give a, a quick historical background on so, this one. Um, a lot of the regenerative biology uh, era, which took place 80, 90 years ago, this is when we, when I say regenerative biology era, this is at the time when we started studying regeneration uh, in animals like salamanders uh, and frogs and, and worms and starfish. Uh, it happened so long ago, yet we had that knowledge locked away in the historical scientific literature, uh, you know, an arm, we've known that we can sever a spinal cord of a salamander a hundred years ago and it grows back in perfect structure and function mm. and the animal is not paralyzed two weeks later. Mm. We've known about this. What is really exciting and pleasurable to me is that we are reconnecting in 2018, a hundred years later with what was known. And I, I'm a great fan of the future. I'm a futurist at heart, mm. but I am also a big fan of the past. Uh, and if we can only unlock a small percent of everything that's ever happened <laughs> in the 20th century alone, research wise, um, we will unlock a plethora of possibilities uh, that we could have only dreamed of. And it's just, once again, I, you know, as a side note and cocktail hour talk, I love pointing out about how much we learned as humans in the last hundred years yes. and how much we forgot. Totally. Uh, and so that's, that's a pleasurable thing when I, un when we unlock some of that. It's, it's almost like we've known about this for so long we have some of the answers already staring us in the face. Why haven't we done anything with it? And it's probably 
the same with many things. You know, we're always looking to reinvent something from scratch when actually you only need to look at the evidence that was there previously and build on that rather than start with a, a blank sheet of paper. Um, Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And the, the, I mean, the problem in, in, in my industry, uh, which I routinely point out, is this overall uh, path uh, and and move throughout the decades towards uh, an increased reductionism in everything. So uh, we got more and more interested in the micro, uh, the genes, the proteins. But as we went in that direction, um, you know, we thought that answers would flow from the very small. The answers don't flow from the very small. Answers flow from the system, the hierarchy above it. I, I point out, for instance, genes, which have been very exciting in terms of the human genome over the last 20 years. They don't do anything. <laughs> well, by themselves, they don't do anything. They are just pieces of biologic information mm. uh, that build other things. Our DNA builds RNA, which builds amino acids, which then builds proteins. But by themselves, they do nothing. They take instructions from above, from the overall system yes. of the human body. Uh, we've forgotten that in biology. Uh, we've forgotten all about, hey, you know, yes, that's a gene, but it's part of a living system. And the joke goes, um, I forget who uses this analogy. You know, when you get into biology nowadays, uh, What's the first thing you do? You kill. <laughs> you study. You study life, but you kill in the lab. You know, you chop stuff apart, whether yes. it's plants or. Uh, uh, but we don't learn from dead stuff. We learn from the living system, and so the more we can get back to that concept, uh, the more beneficial things are going to turn out for us uh, in this space. So that it's my opinion. I, I I like the way your thinking is for sure. Because it's it sounds refreshing and different. And do you have do you believe that that there is a groundswell of other people in this industry that are thinking in the same way? It is happening. Uh, and if you you know you know the certain areas to look, you will see it. Um, uh, there are when I when I talk about what we're doing, I, I'll put it into a basket of. Um, non-traditional um, biomaterials. And for instance, one place where there's a lot of momentum is in the area of the so-called microbiome. So uh, you and I and everybody listening to this show, aside from being uh, Michael and Ira and so forth as a human, uh, we also have an estimated 100 trillion non-human things, bacteria, fungi, viruses, other microorganisms living on us, in us uh, today. So we are far from 100% human right now. Uh, and what you see uh, in the area of microbiome and virome research is this idea that, hey, living organisms, even viruses, which you know, we think are these pathogenic things, a very small percent of them kill us. The large majority of them are good for us, uh, are beneficial to our bodies. Yes. Uh, and so you see some companies developing live cocktails, we'll call them, of bacteria, fungi, viruses as therapeutic tools. Mm. Uh, and we know that, hey, you know, if something is wrong nowadays in our, uh, you know, chronic inflammation in the gut, as an example, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, well, there is a reason we have, you know, 50 trillion other folks <laughs> living inside us yes. doing things. And we need to understand that and not just think of, you know, obliterating them because there's more of them <laughs> than us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally true. And yeah, I've, I mean, I've, you mentioned antibiotics a little bit earlier in the conversation. And of course, what we know, and I, I have not studied medical science i've i've studied a bit of alternative so mm -hmm. it's really interesting that i'm having this conversation with you but obviously with antibiotics we know it kills a lot of the good bio in your gut as well and so um the probiotics um 
are extremely good for us because it can build back some of the some of the um, good uh, flora that you will have lost when you take antibiotics as well. So it's it's interesting that they are looking at this now in that way. Yeah, probiotics are a very uh, fascinating uh, field of endeavor, and and you know, just a, as a side note, along the lines of the antibiotic field, um, you know, we developed, as I mentioned, the antibiotic about a hundred years ago, and now a hundred years later, we are faced with these uh, drug resistant. Mm bugs that you know everyone is talking about now that are coming and we have no answers for because most drug companies stopped antibiotic research. Yes. Uh, they, they are not involved in it anymore. What we point out, and this is another area of sort of this combinatorial systems-based thinking, uh, every other species out there, I, I point for instance to the trees outside of my window right here, um, they get sick too from bacteria, from fungi, from viruses. But they don't take antibiotics. They synthesize mixtures of substances to kill those bacteria and viruses in select ways. Uh, we point out that nowhere in nature, anywhere on this planet, do you ever see the so-called single magic bullet uh, that big pharma likes to pursue. Mm. If that, if this tree outside my window took, you know, a single magic bullet approach to disease, it would not be here. It would be extinct. Yes. And so this is another area that we are only beginning to appreciate uh, in the area of what a therapeutic should look like. Um, and it's not, in our opinion, in the future, going to be a little white pill no. uh, in a bottle that you take every day. The things are going to look decidedly different. Oh, fascinating. I, I I I can't wait for that day. <laughs> Definitely, that Me sounds too. exciting, Ira. So, as a business owner for the last seven years or so, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you you will have gone through the kind of business owner roller coaster. You've you've worked in big companies, small companies, and then big companies, then giant companies. And um, there's no better way of knowing what goes on than actually starting something on your own. We would like to give some advice to people that are listening to this podcast. Um, do you have, even if it just was one, but you can do more than one if you'd like to, if you had just one bit of advice you'd like to give some aspiring business owners out there, I'm not necessarily talking about going in such a massive risky area that you're involved in, but any advice other than, you know, raising millions of dollars? <laughs> sure, sure. You know, it's funny. Someone, someone gave me a question uh, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, if I could go back in time and talk to myself as a child, yes. uh, what advice I would give. And it's the same advice. Mm. Do not you know, keep your ears closed when it comes to the critics, when it comes to the naysayers. Mm. Um, the worst thing you could have, uh, both for your health and for your business health, uh, is a negative attitude. Uh, they and, and specifically, once again, yeah, it is high risk. But in this industry, 99.999% of anyone you meet has failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and although they might want you to succeed and you, know, you come up with a cure to can for cancer and uh, a cure for external li eternal life, at the end of the day, they, <laughs> they failed and they still have that in the back of their mind that they failed and you might succeed. Mm -hmm. So you cannot spend one second, you know, thinking about what the crit criticism is uh, obviously important criticism if you're doing an experiment slightly wrong or you can, that's fine. Uh, we, we openly accept those types of critiques. But the overall sort of naysayers that will constantly in this space be telling you that'll never happen or that can't be done because it's never happened. You know, it's a, mm. a self-fulfilling argument um, is a waste of your time, uh, is a waste of your emotional health. And. My advice to my, me in the past is keep your head down and just pursue your dreams and your, your program mm. uh, because you're the one that uh, you need to be listening to for the most part. And who instilled that into you? Because starting what you've started 
being such high risk and not listening to the naysayers or the negative comments that might be out there to directed towards you. So who who you know how did you get that that thought process? Um, well, two things. One, uh, I put it up to my father because you know, as I said, from a very young age, I saw him uh, persevering mm. uh, and and. You know, it, it's not always a straight line to success in any business. And I saw him go through the trials and tribulations of small business uh, 50 years ago. So, uh, you know, he instilled that in me. At the same time, once again, uh, I uh, also have a passion for seeing what came before. And uh, the real when you when you look back uh, at the the real major <laughs> advances in a hundred years, you know, from a hundred years ago. Um, the Wright brothers uh, were bicycle manufacturers, mm -hmm. right? They were not experts in aerodynamics uh, or, or, or uh, specific disciplines with regard to uh, lighter than air flight. Uh, and they just tinkered. They, you know, they were not put off by the concept that something was potentially unachievable. Yes. Uh, same with Thomas Edison, right? I mean, here you have somebody he's famous for this quote, you know, I did not fail. <laughs> I did not fail a thousand times. No. Uh, I figured out a thousand ways that didn't work <laughs> and I kept doing it. So um, you got to you got to keep your mind in the right space and realize that there's others that came before you that also were there uh, in the on the sort of the precipice of uh, infinity uh, and. Um, took a step yes. to do something dramatically different. And once again, if you have a tough outer shell, um, I say, come on into this business because it's for you. <laughs> yeah. And and at the same time also, the, we're all human, right? So we have this range of emotions that we, however confident we might be, every day we get up, we'll go, you know, we're not failing, we're not failing, we're succeeding, you know. I can overcome, I've got a thick skin, we can have all those mantras, but we're also human and things do go wrong and we have setbacks. And how do you manage to deal with the setbacks? Uh, I look at my family uh, and I realize, you know what, uh, I've succeeded already in life. Uh, you know, the most important thing is them. <laughs> mm. And at the end of the day, keep in mind that uh, look, if I don't solve, uh, if I don't find the cure for cancer uh, or the cure for uh, health pan extension and I fail miserably, uh, it will still happen. It, it'll, somebody else will come behind uh, on our work and mm -hmm. take over. But at the end of the day, uh, what's most important to me is still here and um, and they keep me going. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it, I, look, I've I've seen a lot of weird stuff over the uh, you know the, the past in this space from people. You know, they, they have one experiment that fails and they're gone. <laughs> they're they're in a different industry yes. to people that have actually you know try to take their life because their company didn't work out. Mm. So, um, no, I no, I'm not that. <laughs> I don't care that much about. What, I care about what I'm doing. Yes, but I know the bigger picture behind it. Uh, my wife and my children are much more important than any of this. So. Uh, if I fail, I fail, but um, I'm pretty confident. With well, what I'm doing. I, I totally concur with you. There is no such thing as failing. There is only learning and growing and, you know, whatever you're doing, you're constantly learning about that thing. And whether it's, you know, biotech development and the cure for cancer, whatever it might be, or it is making postcards. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Whoever wants to start a business and be entrepreneurial and grow something on their own or, you know, even have a lifestyle business doesn't matter. Um, I think you've got to feel open, as you're saying, you've got you're doing this in a massive way. and You're such a great example for that. You are going in an industry where failure is so common, therefore, the likelihood could be that it's not going to be a massive success. And therefore, you know, you, that's the same really for any organization because the statistics there confirm, you know, very small percentage of firms actually succeed. So 
Thank you for your inspiration on that. That's really, really awesome. And I wish you just massive success with it. Thank you for that. Um, so um, we're, we're starting to come to the end uh, of our interview. And um, it would be great for people to follow you and your journey and what you're up to. So my last question is how could people get in touch with you, Ira? Where can they locate you and find out what you're up to? Uh, just come to our website, uh, bioquark.com. Uh, we talk about everything uh, that we are involved in from R&D to partnerships. Um, we're an open book. Uh, we love talking about what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're passionate about it. Uh, contact us through the website. Uh, contact me directly through the website. Uh, I, I talk to everybody because I want the message out there that yes. uh, beyond what we're doing, if you just put our company aside for a minute, um, and this industry, which has, you know, unfortunately been seen as either, you know, evil or boring or always promising things that are 50 years away, mm. uh, has amazing potential uh, in the coming decade. Uh, and if we, you know, can forget a, for a, a couple of minutes about the uh, nuclear test in North Korea and refugees in, uh, in the Middle East and so forth, mm. and a lot of these big problems uh, that, you know, you know, we see every day uh, and also take a look at some of the potential of our future, um, I think we'll all be the better off for it. So yeah. I, I really encourage everybody to to take a big sky picture of what's happening. Great. So go through your website, any social media channels or? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, uh, I'm all over the place in terms of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, you, Google, you can Google my name and Find and, you that and, connect way. With, and connect with me. I'm, I'm an open connector to everybody. So uh, right. reach out to me. Uh, I'd okay. love to talk. Fantastic. Well, I will certainly be following your journey and I wish you massive success. And if, if I'm stateside in your area, I'll shout out. If you're in the UK, in London, give me a shout. I'll come down and we can have a coffee. Um, Absolutely. But it's been wonderful listening to you and the amazing mission you have ahead of you. And again, I'll repeat again, wishing you massive success and wishing for some amazing breakthroughs there, Ira. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's uh, I, I really appreciate it. Take care. All the best. Bye for now. Take care. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. <laughs>